This is the Wow Signal podcast from the future. It's October 2014, and this is season two, episode five, The Long Delay. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr. It's good to be back after taking a couple of episodes off from hosting. I hope we'll continue to rotate hosts, so I hope I will host every other episode or so. And I promise we'll work out the little audio issues we had in the last two episodes as the team gains more confidence. I think it's more important to invest in bringing the team up to speed than to have a perfect podcast. On this episode, we are going to combine two things that so far we have kept separate. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, and the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, or SETA, which includes the hunt for Bracewell probes. We covered SETI a bit in episode 6 of season 1 with Seth Shostak as our guest, and SETA in episodes 5 and 10 of season 1. Since then, it occurs to me that by and large, SETA is really just local SETI. Then, when I talked to astronomy professor Alan Penny about SETI, he mentioned the search for bracewell probes as part of the future of SETI. And I had just had a discussion with Duncan Lunard about this very search and some intriguing data that may hint at their existence. We'll start with my discussion with Alan Penny on the future of SETI. Dr. Penny is coordinating a meeting of the UK SETI Research Network this month at the University of London and also was involved with the two-day SETI session at a meeting of UK astronomers at St. Andrews last year. There is interest in SETI in Europe and elsewhere, but as you will hear, they struggle with funding even more than the US-based SETI groups. Alan Penny is honorary reader and visiting scientist in the astronomy group in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He has authored or co-authored more than 100 papers in various areas of astronomy, including a number of investigations regarding exoplanets. He is the coordinator of the UK SETI Research Network. Thank you for sharing some of your time with us on the Wow Signal. You recent you uh, have a conference coming up, I believe. Uh, yes, next week. And that that's a uh, the SETI Research Network that you have. Yes, we've um, in the UK we've set up this little network of people who are who've been publishing in SETI uh, because we're we're all a very disparate group. So we decided it would be good if we. Uh, got together from time to time and exchanged uh, support. Here in the U.S., SETI is not government-funded. It's funded primarily, uh, almost exclusively, by private donations and corporate funds. Uh, Is that the same case in the U.K.? Uh, It's even worse. Uh, We have practically no funding at all. Uh, There's no public funds and there's no private funds. Uh, the the stuff we do is sort of academics in their spare time, as it were, mm. uh, doing work. And uh, one of the point of, one of the points of setting up the network was seeing if we can um, make proposals for funding, probably first of all from private 
before we go for the, the public route. I see. So um, the uh, you, you mentioned in your uh, on your webpage that you're working on something called LOFAR, and there's a LOFAR array being built in the UK. No, no this is a European uh, radio telescope. It's, oh. it's mainly Dutch. It's uh, based in in the Netherlands, um, but there are nodes in a number of European countries, France, Germany, Poland, and the UK. So it's a, it's a sort of distributed radio telescope um, whereby the signal from a large number of um, telescopes in Holland and the smaller number spread across Europe, working at low frequencies, which hasn't been done before much in radio astronomy. Uh, so it's, it's a really breakthrough instrument for, for low frequency radio astronomy. And um, the aim of um, thinking about doing SETI with, with it is that there's been very little work done uh, looking for looking for signals at the low, this low frequency. So this new instrument is very very fascinating. How low frequency are we talking about? With low far is it? It works from about twenty megahertz up to two hundred megahertz. That's uh, wavelengths of 2 to 20 meters. Okay. Um, most radio telescopes normally work at um, 1,400 megahertz, so, so this is a uh, very low frequency. I mean, you, your FM radio works at 90 megahertz. Uh, last year when I spoke to uh, Seth Shostak, he, mm -hmm. he, said, he said, I asked him, what's the question nobody asks you? And he said, the, the question that nobody asks me is, why is SETI such a a U.S. centric activity. Why doesn't? But but you you I think what you're hearing from you is that there is interest in in Europe. Uh, there's just no funding. Is that? Well, I mean, there's there's interested in you know all all around the world. Uh, there's a there's a guy in Japan. There's a couple of people in Italy. Uh, but I think in terms of people publishing. Uh, the UK is probably the largest one outside the US, mm. although the UK has never done a SETI search, whereas there's, there have been groups in France and Argentina which have done proper searches. So although America is by far and away the most active SETI nation, um, there, there is interest out, outside, um, the, outside the US. But it's true that because there's been the private funding um, of the SETI Institute in particular, and there's a group at Berkeley and a group at Harvard who have a mixture of private funding and sort of a, a, a university faculty using their own time, mm -hmm. that they're in a position to do more work. Is, is this a cultural issue? Is, it, is there an acceptance of SETI as legitimate science in Europe as well as in the US? Um, that's a very difficult question. Um, SETI is, I would describe it as tolerated by proper scientists, as it were. Um, I think what gave America a big boost was in the 70s and 80s, NASA got behind it in a big way. Mm -hmm. And they spent a lot of money, um, both, both the, uh, employing people to study it and also uh, building equipment. And although that funding ended in the early 90s, it sort of built up a, built up a base. I see. But also it's been up to individual people. But I think also in America there's more of a, on the private funding side, there's more of an ethos of, of people funding physical science experiments, which there is less of in outside the US. So here in Britain, we have a, a very big medical charity, which well, one of the, I think is the biggest one in the world, which funds great medical science. We have very little physical science private funding. Mm -hmm. And I'm not too sure why it is. We'd like to change that, but I don't know, I, I don't know why it is. It must be some cultural basis that this is thought to be government money. Let's talk a little bit about how you see the future of SETI research 
proceeding, uh, understanding that there's funding will continue to be constrained, compared to where we are now, uh, and you, in your paper you talk a bit about the Allen Telescope Array, and, and I'll have a link to that paper in the show notes. Anybody who wants to read it can do so. Um, but compared to where we are now, where would you like to see us progress over the next generation or so? Well, um, I think there's two questions there. It's where would I like to see us go and where I think we're going to go? Okay. I mean, obviously what we need is more money. We need government scientists, the people who sit on committees um, in the physical sciences and astronomy um, to believe that SETI is worth doing. I mean, in terms of the total astronomy funding, uh, the sort of money uh, which SETI is running at, even if you add everything together in America, it's only a few million dollars a year, whereas they're spending, NASA and other sources are spending thousands of millions of dollars a year. So one hopes there's going to be a sort of sea change in what one might call mainline scientists' view to SETI and that more funding will become available, especially, of course, our interest is in the, in the UK. And one of the purposes of setting up our network is to try and lobby for more funding. Sure. Um, if that becomes available, there are many instruments becoming online which we can use. The Allen Telescope Array, which is privately funded, um, if that could get some government money, that, uh, the SETI Institute could do more work. But there are new telescopes coming online, like the LOFAR, Low Frequency Telescope. Uh, if we could get people to work on SETI, you know, sort of postdocs and stuff like that, we could extend the field of SETI. So, so as it were, there's two ways to go in SETI. One is you can do more and deeper searches in the existing methods, which has been mainly radio telescopes and a little bit of optical telescopes. So you could do bigger and and better searches, or you could use new instruments like the, as I said, like LOFI and low frequency radio astronomy. And in the next decade, there's going to be the next generation radio telescope called the Square Kilometre Array, mm -hmm. which is, as it says on the tin, is effectively um, by joining together hundreds of telescopes to produce a, a telescope with an effective dish uh, of um, a kilometre across be much more sensitive and also be able to look at many more sources. So you could do very different types of science. Um, so either both deeper in the existing ones and in new areas, so low frequency in radio, many more objects. Uh, an interesting field which has not very well been looked at is to look for possible probes in the solar system. And it's always been a big puzzle uh, why, if ET is out there, why hasn't it come here? And this is known as the Fermi paradox. Um, but, but one option is perhaps they are here. Perhaps there are stealth probes in the asteroid belt. And it would be good to do deeper surveys of the asteroids to see if there are any strange-looking ones. These are the so-called Bracewell probes? Yeah, yeah, sort of. Um, ET, if it exists, they could come from a civilization which is a billion years more advanced than us. Right. So the universe has been around for 14 billion years. Um, and in that case, they, if they're here, then they're not obvious. Um, we, they don't seem to land on Earth, and we can't see them in the sky. But, they, but there might be one way they might do it is to send a probe to every star which would look around for millions and millions of years and just monitor what's happening. And if it sees signs of civilization, it sends a signal back. Perhaps we've got one of those in our solar system. It would be, be nice to have a deeper search to see if we just on the off chance. Yes, it would. Um, is there astronomical data that is available now that could be searched for that? Yes. I mean, there's, um, uh, there's a lot of work uh, being done on the colors of asteroids, and there has been a search, I think about a decade ago, going through that catalog looking for something with a strange color and nothing was found but that was only a few thousand objects have got colors so it'd be good to do an awful lot more and perhaps look at smaller ones yes. i mean it could, it could be an asteroid belt or or they could be in sort of orbit around the earth you know, if you had a 
the one meter probe um, roughly as far away as the moon. Um, it'd be difficult to see, but you could see it with uh, a good search with present day optical telescopes. Hmm. At present, a lot of the search is for narrow band beacon type signals. Are we going to go beyond that or looking for things like uh, pulses or um, other types of, of possible uh, signals, not, not just beacons, but actual eavesdropping? Do, will we have that capability with something like the square kilometer array? Um, well, we have that take capability uh, at present. I mean, the, um, the searches which are being done, the ones at Berkeley using the Arecibo telescope and the, the SET Institute and, and other searches in the past, although they do look for narrowband signals, if you had a signal which was, say, modulated at a, uh, 100 hertz, um, it would still be very, it would still be very, very narrow band. So the searches would pick it up. But if, there were, if but so there could be pulses coming at that rate with a signal in them, and, you, and these searches would still pick up, pick those up. Mm. Um, now there's a possibility that it could be much broader band, and there's been some calculations about how you would look for much broader band signals and sort of distinguish that from noise. Um, but um, as, as long as the signal wasn't too complex, right. um, the present searches and future searches should pick it up. Hmm. So there might be a signal. Right. And then there's the whole, opti right. the whole optical. Um, might be a message. Yes. Uh, the whole optical area as well. Uh, now, that both of, both of these types of searches generally require uh, some kind of instrument that's pointing in a very specific direction, right? I mean, it, like the uh, even our Arecibo, as it sweeps across the sky at any given time, is integrating a, a small part of the sky. Is uh, is there any work being done that? could lead to more of an omnidirectional type array that could detect a signal from anywhere? Well, I mean, obviously that's more difficult in the optical. Um, things like low far on the square kilometre array, um, since they're made up of a number of dishes, you can make more than one beam. Um, so you can monitor a dozen directions in the sky, which is obviously not the whole sky. But there are, but there, there are also searches using the Low far, which do monitor the whole sky, uh, looking for uh, pulses, looking for things like uh, meteors and um, bursts. So, so, so those searches could be extended to look for SETI type signals covering the whole sky. They're not at the moment because we have no manpower to to work on the software. But in, but in theory, yes, you could have an all sky radio search. So, so rather than scanning the sky like Arecibo does, you could monitor the whole sky. Um, in the optical, it's more difficult. Um, you, there are optical telescopes being built which will scan the whole sky in a matter of days, and the data from that could be analysed. But it's more difficult in the optical to distinguish between an artificial and a natural source. Um, one way, you know, one of the, the optical searches at the moment are mainly looking for very short flashes, very short pulses, right. nanosecond pulses. Not because that's why you're, not because you're sure that's what they're doing, but because if they were doing that, it couldn't be a natural source. It would have to be an artificial source. Right. So, so you, at the moment, there's the, Berkeley Group have done a survey of the nearest 5,000 stars looking for these flashes, and the Harvard has got an, uh, a telescope which scans the whole sky so once a month looking for them. And you could uh, make a more complex telescope which did look at the whole sky with, you know, at a lower frequency, but um, that hasn't been implemented yet. I see. Given where we've been so far with SETI, um, there seems to be some controversy about uh, just how strange the silence is. 
Do we is is the search space well enough covered that we can say that we're experiencing a silence that is hard to explain? No. Um, the trouble is we don't know how big the search space is. We don't know what ET is like. Um, could be like us. Um, and at the moment, um, if supposing there was an us in somewhere amongst the nearest stars, our telescopes would not be able to pick up stuff. I mean, the strongest sources, the easiest things to pick up from us would be something like airport radars, which are pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And if we looked at the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, our biggest telescopes couldn't pick that up. But something like the Square Kilometre Array should be able to see us uh, if there was us on a planet around a very nearby star. But that's only one possibility. Uh, we might, you might say we'd be, us is only going to be us for a few hundred years, and in a hundred years' time we're going to be doing something very different. So how to look for ET is, is the big problem. You can look for things which if ET was doing it you would find, but what does a billion-year-old civilization do? Um, you just don't know. So you don't know how big the search group is. Yeah, it's, it's like taking a bucket um, and putting it in a swimming pool. And if you did that, you know, 20 or 30 times and nothing came up, you might think, well, perhaps this swimming pool's got nothing but water. But you don't know how big a swimming pool is. You might be putting a bucket into the Atlantic. And if you put your bucket 10 times into the Atlantic and came up with nothing, you might say, oh, there's no fish in the Atlantic. You'd be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. I think uh, Jill Charters used the same, uh, no, same metaphor. I, I, I probably copied it from her. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, um, yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, that's one of the yeah. real problems with SETI. Um, you don't know what you're looking for. You don't know how to look for it. Uh, and you don't know if you're looking for it in the best way. Just because you, you don't know what ET is like. In the, uh, the famous Drake equation that been used to estimate the number of civilizations we might be able to have a conversation with. Uh, so that's, that's not entirely correct. The Drake equation tells you the number of, well, it provides the parameters for putting in estimates which would tell you the number of, of civilizations like us. Right. Uh, but it sort of says, well, it's up Civilizations like us would only last for, say, a thousand years. But after a thousand years, they'll become something else. And we could still have a conversation with a very advanced source, but we don't know how to find it. Right. So, so the Drake equation tells you how to find us, but estimates are that even when you're being optimistic, us is going to be quite some distance away. And our present telescopes wouldn't pick that up. Well, could is it possible that uh, I know we we've sent some a few signals out into deep space uh, for the purpose of of SETI. Uh, the I, I guess it's uh, METI is called the messaging to enter extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> One was a uh, response to the Wow signal. Uh, is there how far away? Do we think it'd be reasonable for another civilization to be able to pick up a signal from Earth, given our current technology, or do we just not know? Well, if we're if we're talking about um, things like the signal sent up uh, from the Arecibo telescope, Arecibo in Puerto Rico, you know, it's a thousand feet across. It's it's got a very powerful radar, which is used to send a radio pulse out, and that bounces off a asteroid or something and you can study the asteroid. Now, now, those pulses are quite strong, and if there was an Arecibo in another planet pointing at us at the right time, that, that could pick us up over the thousands of light, uh, well, hundreds of light years at least. Um, so, in theory, if we, if we um, were sending out a message which... 400 years later, arrives at them, they could pick it up from a long way away. So, so in theory, they, they could see us. Uh, I mean, we've been sending out radio signals 
for 100 years, you know, ever since the first ra radio sets started working in the 1910s. And we've been sending out things like airport radars for 50 years. So if there's anything within 50 light years, um, they would have, and they, they weren't too much more advanced than us, so us in 100 years, they would be able to detect us. Right, and they know that we are here. And, uh -huh. But until that time, they don't know we're here, right? So, um, Well, if they're a billion years more advanced and they've got probes in our solar system... They might very well, yes. I mean, their probes have been... For the last 50,000 years, their probes have been studying the rise of Homo sapiens and sending the messages back. Um, if they're like us... Uh, they've only know, known about us recently. Right. Yes, it depends what they're like. You, you, you really don't know. Yes, true. So what we're really trying to do is take things that we reasonably can know about, like the fact that n natural radio sources are wide are wideband, and just turn those into hypotheses that we can actually do some kind of investigation with. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, it's, uh, the standard um, analogy is... Um, you walk back home from the bar over along a street with a few lamp, a few street lamps, and you realise you drop your key, and you go back and you don't look at the where it's dark. You look where the lights are, not because you know the keys are there, but if they're in the dark bits, you can't find them. So we do the searches um, using looking for things like these narrowband radios or nanosecond optical flashes. Because if if they are there, we can we know they're artificial. But there's certainly there's room for some more creativity about what we what we could actually. Absolutely, absolutely. What we need is what we need is more effort. Um, at the moment, we do the what you might call the simplest things. Yes. Um, uh, but more diverse things, which is, I'm sure that's one of the ways to go is to try and widen the scope. Um, and that's what we would really like more money for. Yeah, it could be a lot more money. I mean, right? I mean, if we start to say look at X rays, we would need satellites to do that. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, at the moment, we sort of piggyback on what the astronomers have been done. I mean, the Allen Telescope Array is one of the few examples of actually a, a radio telescope built to do SETI. Uh, Whereas things like Arecibo and LOFAR are existing telescopes, which we um, get time on. But obviously, if you had a lot more money, you could build dedicated tel telescopes, uh, which would be great. At present, it's against the law for NASA to, to fund SETI, but... Uh, uh, it's, it's unclear about that. Um, although they were stopped in the 90s, um, they are starting to fund SETI-related stuff, stuff like um, signal processing, uh, which is sort of dual use, as it were. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think NASA is it's difficult to tell, but it might be edging towards getting back in the game. Yeah. Well, they're certainly interested in astrobiology, and of yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they they found that not only is legitimate science being done there, but it's uh, it's has a sexiness that the public appreciates so indeed the um indeed. and there's a whole new generation of of young scientists who call themselves astrobiologists i would like to get any further thoughts that you have about the future of SETI, uh not not only in the uk but worldwide and what's one or two things that the scientific community or the public could be doing to advance that well i think there's um, there's a great scope for SETI. I mean, there's lots of things which we would like to do which we haven't got the resources. And, um, and of course, the, um, the way the public can get involved. I mean, the public's very interested on this. You know, if you give a lecture, public lecture on SETI, um, you, you get crowds coming. Um, and it's not just, you know, the UFO nuts. It's, um, you know, people interested in science. And... There have been efforts in crowdsourcing. Um, the SETI Institute uh, gets some money from, from the general public. Um, so 
crowdfunding, um, a sort of also citizen science, where things like SETI at home, where people use their PCs to analyze the data, uh, has been a great success over the last 15 years. Um, so crowdsourcing, what we need is a few billionaires to do what Paul <laughs> Allen did and get behind us. And we need the scientific community to wake up and, and think this is worth a bit. So let, let's, uh, let's talk just a, briefly about um, the optimistic scenario that uh, something Seth Shostak's been promoting heavily lately, that we might find a signal. Um, what do you think would change if we found a signal, even if it were thousands of years old? Well, everything would change. Um, it would be the greatest discovery since discovering fire. It would open up the prospect of learning of our knowledge leaping forward by a thousand, hundred thousand million years. Uh, yeah, the first thing it would do is it would open the floodgates of government, government money. Um, you know, if there's just a very faint signal, or what do you say it's artificial, then there's going to be a big telescopes built to try and see if there's a, if there's a message in it. Um, and if, if there's a message, what does it mean? Does it, is it, telling us about future science? Is it telling us, uh, you know, that we are, we are the scum of the universe and we're about to be destroyed? Uh, the prospects are infinite and mind, mind-boggling. Yes, they are. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Um, so thanks, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Okay, been a pleasure. Okay, well, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. We just had the Scottish independence vote last week, and that result works out for me because I still get to speak of Alan Penny as a UK astronomer. I'd like to thank Dr. Penny for appearing on the WOW signal, and good luck to the UK SETI Research Network and to the LOFAR SETI project. Wherever you are, UK or elsewhere, please consider donating a little cash to your local SETI organizations. There is absolutely no reason why SETI should be a USA-only enterprise, and no one in the USA will have their feelings hurt if it isn't. You may recall Dr. Penny spoke briefly about the possibility of bracewell probes, and I asked him about how they might be detected. In episode five of season one of this podcast, I talked at length about bracewell probes. Duncan Lunan is a Scottish polymath who thinks that we might already have a clue as to the whereabouts of a bracewell probe. In what follows, you will hear about Lagrange points. There are five of these for any two bodies orbiting each other in a near circular orbit. But the two stable Lagrange points, L4 and L5, in the Earth-Moon system are especially good candidates for a Bracewell probe. If you draw a line from the Earth to the Moon and use this line as the base for two equilateral triangles, one above the line and one below it, then the L4 and L5 points are at the apex of each triangle. Therefore, they are at the same distance from the Earth as the Moon is, and vice versa. You can park a probe at L4 or L5, and it will stay there a long time. Earth, Moon, L1, and L3 are good spots as well, but you would have to actively control the orbit with some sort of propulsion system, which might attract attention. At Dream of the Open Channel, the parent blog for this podcast, 
I have an article that discusses the long delay echoes. And we'll have links in the show notes to several articles on this phenomenon. Long delay echoes remain a scientific mystery. And a natural explanation has not been entirely ruled out. Please note that it is only through science that we even know this is a mystery at all. I don't want to use the word mystery to imply that there is some other way than science so we can figure out what the LDEs are. The answers, given that they are forthcoming, may surprise us or they may simply require a novel application of current theory. As always, I advocate following the evidence where it leads, even if it leads us away from our comfort zone. Duncan Lunin took seriously the possibility that the LDEs were signals echoed back to Earth from a Bracewell probe and tried to understand what the delay times might mean. Following Ronald Bracewell's suggestion, he interpreted one set of delay times as a star map. And I'll let him tell you the rest of the story. I'd like to start with the long-delayed echoes. Now, these were first observed in shortwave radio, I believe, in the 1920s by uh, some Danish astronomers or da- Danish uh, physicists. Is that correct? Um, yeah, we can refine, refine that slightly. In um, 1927, initially, they were reported by uh, an observer called Hals, who was a, a telephone engineer by, by profession, and um, a radio enthusiast um, in his uh, in his spare time, as it as it were, he was taking part in a worldwide experiment which had been or- organised by Phillips and Einhorn, where they were uh, transmitting the Morse letter S and uh, asking people to listen for it. They were putting it out at five second intervals and asking people around the world to listen for echoes bouncing between the ionosphere and the, and the ground. Um, house, uh, that should, going right around the world, that would take one-seventh of a second, so you'd get a kind of beep-beep, beep-beep sound. House found that he was hearing echoes with a delay of three seconds, and realising that was the distance to the orbit of the moon, he thought they were actually bouncing off the moon, which proved not to be the, be the case. Um, he reported them to Carl Stirner, who was a physicist and an expert on the Aurora Borealis. They were both in, in Oslo. And um, Stirner jumped to the conclusion that these were bouncing off a sphere of electrons, which he had predicted would surround the, the Earth-Moon system uh, beyond, beyond the Moon's orbit. They both got, uh, they and everyone else at the time, got hung up on this idea that they were... Um, physical echoes that they were hearing. And and it didn't occur to them that the the volume of the returning signals was too loud for that. Some, um, at the apparent distance involved, um, something had to be both amplifying and delaying the pulses. At any rate, Stoner contacted van der Poel at Eindhoven, who was in, in charge of the experiments, and they increased the separation between the outgoing pulses initially to 20 seconds, to, to, so that they could hear the returning signals more clearly. And um, remarkably enough, there was a delay of a, a couple of weeks, and then the echoes came back, in quotation marks, came back, initially with a three-second delay, then shortly afterwards going to four seconds, then to five, and then beginning to, to vary up to 15 seconds, but with no variation in, inten- in, in intensity, this should really have told them that they weren't. This, yeah, the sig- the sig- difference in signal paths should have meant the longer de- delayed ones were much weaker. But they were all coming in at the same strength, 
And this should have told them that there, there was a, com a, a common source involved, but they didn't catch on to that. Um, Van der Poel then increased the separation between his outgoing pulses to 30 seconds, and there was a further delay, and then when the echoes came back, now they were varying up, up to 30 seconds. All of which is rather like what you might expect if um, a braceable probe was picking up these these messages and responding to them and thinking that the, the increases in delay were in, inviting it to put some more complex pattern into, into the signals. Now, it was... Um, Ron Bracewell at Stanford in the in the late fifties, who suggested this might have been a probe from another civilization trying to attract attention, and um, he in one of his one of the two papers in which he mentioned this, he he said, "Should we be surprised if the first message were subsequently received was a television image of a constellation to tell us where the probe had come from?" Now, my, my attention was brought to this by the, the late John McVeigh, him, himself a, a radio amateur and, um, uh, and a variable stars observer, but uh, an industrial chemist by profession. And he, he told me about this, or drew my attention to it, in 1967. And when I, when I went to write it up for my first book, Man and the Stars, I looked up the original papers in Nature by, by Sturmer, and as far as I could see, the variations in the echo delay times were, were just a random sequence. And I, I wrote it up saying it looks like a natural phenomenon of some kind, whatever it is. But then I went on, the, the bit about the television image of a constellation worked in my mind. And it, it occurred to me that because the stars are spaced at random in the sky, it was... Uh, a set of star map coordinates would be a random series of numbers. And um, when I tried it, drawing a graph and plotting the delay time against the sequence in which the echoes were received, at only the second attempt, I got what appeared to be a recognisable image of the constellation Boötes, the, the herdsman with the star Epsilon Boötes picked out. And... Um, Immediately, I you know I just looked at it, and that was my that was my wow moment in my in my life to date. Yeah, when I just looked at it and went, that looks like an intelligent signal. In fact, it looks familiar. I know what that is, and my brain just went into cascade, going, uh, and we are not alone. Interstellar travel is possible. We can read the message. Logic is universal, and uh, it was a, it was a tremendous moment. And um, so I, I then looked up Epsilon Boötes in star catalogs and discovered it was an orange giant star. And this immediately related to the question Frank Drake had raised about why why should anybody go to these lengths. Um, Clearly, if people were living on a planet orbiting an orange giant star, they'd be in a lot of trouble. They'd be looking for somewhere else to go. And so they would be sending out their spacecraft as soon as they could to look, look for new homes. And it would be a, they would assume that any more advanced... Any, any civilization they contacted would, would li be likely to be more advanced... So, in effect, they were asking for help. The statement, my home is an orange giant star, is like dialing 999 or, you would say, 9911 and shouting, my house is on fire. You know, the, the statement is an appeal. So they, had, they clearly had the concept of help. And yet it must have occurred to them that they, were, they might reach some less advanced civilization like ours. And they chose, nevertheless not to take advantage of that, but to state their problem in the opening message, which meant that clearly we were dealing with moral beings and that morality as well as logic was, was universal. And all, all, all of this came to me in the space of about an hour um, and I was absolutely over the moon. It took, I was on a high that it took me two years to come down from. 
during which time I attempted to translate the other echo patterns subsequently received in the 20s and thought I had worked out a full consistent translation for them, which turned out in the end not to be valid. Uh, the astronomical facts I, I deduced didn't stand up to more detailed examination. So at the end of it, I, w I was left with just that original signal and the, the possibility that um, maybe I hadn't even got that right. So two years, two years later, I actually withdrew the whole, the whole translation. And then Epsilon Botis wouldn't lie down. It kept coming back in interesting contexts in, in history. Um, some, of it, some of which on analysis are not that surprising because the constellation Bootes contains the ecliptic pole. So um, it's at the center of the zodiac in that sense, if you've got um, a sky map as it's often represented. Uh, with the zodiacal constellations around the edge, then Boates will be in the middle. And it's one of the very few constellations which actually has a, a human form. Um, so uh, it's not too surprising that Epsilon Boates was cropping up in all kinds of cultural references. The Epsilon Boates map, going, going back to that, appears to be dated approximately 10,500 B.C., you get that from the position of Arcturus in the map. Arcturus is a star with a, a large proper motion. It's not, and it's not shown where it is now. It's shown where it was 12 and a half, 13,000 years ago. So if there's a... These kinds of long delay echoes are still observed some, from time to time, are they not? Very rarely now. They were frequent up until 1975. And then after they were in the news as a result of the... You know, the publication that, that I'd done, um, they seem to have died away virtually to nothing. Very occasionally, and one gets reported now, but they're, they're not frequent the way they were. And um, that raises all kinds of other odd questions. In particular, if it is a Bracewell probe, why, why would it uh, not continue once, once, it had, once its presence had finally been recognised? And that's one I don't have an answer to. That. That was an edited version of my discussion with Mr. Lunin about the LDEs. I think it was brave of him to try and figure out an interpretation of them. And I, for one, find his ideas intriguing. If you want to hear the entire conversation with Duncan Lunin about the connections he draws between the LDEs and the star Epsilon Boetes, possible galactic alignments of Stonehenge, um, the Egyptian pyramids, and the medieval story of the Green Children, I will make that available as a free bonus MP3. Go to wowsignalpodcast.com and the entry for this episode, season two, episode five, and click on detailed show notes for the link to the MP3 file. We'll hear more from Mr. Lunar in a near future episode when he, we explore the asteroid threat to Earth and what can be done about it. Only further research and exploration can help to resolve the mystery of the long delay echoes. It seems that the LDEs have largely fallen off our radar, and there has been little or no recent research or attempts to replicate them. Where do you think we should start? If you're an amateur radio operator and would like to give it a go, 
please contact me. I would love to talk to you about it. Even if we can't show that the LDEs are artificial, the Earth-Moon stable Lagrange points, one candidate location for the LDE repeater, are still an important place to search for bracewell probes. The problem is that given the distance, both radar and optical searches are unlikely to turn anything up. And to my knowledge, no spacecraft has ever visited there. Would a mission to Lagrange points L4 or L5 have perhaps a proper scientific or technology demonstration purpose upon which we could piggyback a Bracewell probe search? I don't know the answer to that, but I want to find out. We're about halfway into Season 2 now. I hope you've had a chance to listen to all our four previous episodes, plus our Towel Day special. Of these, the most popular has been Episode 3, Oblique Strategies, with guest futurist Heath Rezebeck and Robin Hansen, and music by Erica Lloyd. If you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe you should subscribe to The Wow Signal. Just search us up on whatever podcatcher software you use on your phone, tablet, or computer, and subscribe. iTunes, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, Miro, etc. And we're almost certainly be in their directory. Now, I always have some stuff I don't know what to do with on the podcast that doesn't quite fit a given episode. If you go to wowsignalpodcast.com, you will find bonus audio content there in increasing amounts. For example, I have Duncan Lunan debunking the Black Knight satellite and possibly some more stuff I failed to use in past episodes. As to what's coming up soon on the podcast, I'm still working on an episode about the actual Wow Signal event in August 1977. I am struggling to find experts to interview. If you know how I can contact Robert Gray, Jerry Emmon, or Robert Dixon, please let me know. Right now, the episode is just me talking, and I think it would be much better if it was more than that. We're working on other new content as well. James Garrison, who interviewed Stephen Dick in our last episode, is working on contacting some more astrobiologists and is researching the literature on the subject of first contact. Mike Mongo will be tracking down asteroid mining luminaries at an upcoming conference. I also have interviewed exoplanetologist Abel Mendez, and I'm looking for an opportunity to present that to you. As always, the invitation is open for any listener to appear on the podcast. Just shoot us an email at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and we'll set up a time to record your comment or question. If you enjoy this show, please support it. At patreon.com, we have set up a way that you can support the show on a per-episode basis. If you've already dropped a little coin on SETI and other worthy charities, please consider supporting the wow signal to the tune of about $1 per episode. You won't notice the expense. The more support we get, the more we can do. It's up to you to decide. The podcast won't go away if you don't donate, but it will get better and more frequent if you do, and we will publicly thank you on air. We really want to hear from our listeners, and there are many ways to catch our ear. We have a Wow Signal subreddit, a listener community on Google+, a Facebook page, and we now have a Twitter account just for this podcast. Follow us now at Podcast Wow. Also, you can just go to wowsignalpodcast.com and leave a comment there. Reviews on iTunes and other similar services really help us get the word out. Now, as you probably have read on the blog, I'm considering a hiatus for the podcast running from about December through January. I think that uh, hiatus will probably happen, but I am considering changes to the format of the podcast. I'd like your input on that. We won't really change the basic content of the podcast, but we want to find a way to get it out more frequently with a simpler workflow. So 
If you've got some ideas what you'd like to hear and how you'd like it done, please give us an email or come over to one of the communities or subreddit and let us know what you think. So I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for joining me. And now, here's George Hrob to take us out with his song, Skeptic. Your guru assures if you follow his regimen You will become a most excellent specimen The power to live on and on for all days Is right at your fingertips if someone pays He says that his aura will keep you alive for free the installments of 1095 The device he uses sucks out the bad juices And leaves no bad bruises It simply deduces the proper percentage of X in your brain This miracle cure leaves no permanent pain And still You can't believe what a skeptic I am Your astral projections are coming along Your chakra and chi are both growing real strong Your cold disappeared after just nine short days All thanks to the words on the whole earth displays Now due to the juices and pills and the creams your body's lost toxins, whatever that means You've stopped eating all of that sinister food Your dinner tastes awful, so it's gotta be good But still You can't believe what a skeptic I am I can't believe you believe in that shell We disagree, but I still give a damn Ramification of treatments from holy men Leaves me slightly queasy deep down in the abdomen Convinced that the lives that they lead need adjusting They drive to the bookstore and blindly start trusting The miracles and cures all laid down in black ink Never even bothering to stop and think If miracle wonders were held in their looks Why waste precious time and try selling their books Why sit and wait for your publishing royalty If one has real power, who needs real loyalty If you could travel by thought to a mystical place Why go to book signings and fight for shelf space Why would you wait for your agent to call you and try to convince you he's worth 12% Why would you bother with talk shows and a crazed publicist? Why deal with the people that repeatedly insist That you show them real proof that your powers exist? Hey, convince some real skeptics or cease and desist For us to miss six months from now, you folks will not be missed What is the moral that we all must learn? Especially those of us with money to burn. Before your eyes widen at the book on the shelf, think Is he helping you? Or is he helping himself? Skeptic I am You Should believe What a skeptic I am This 
This has been episode 5 of season 2 of the WOW Signal podcast. For more information, please visit the show notes at www.wowsignalpodcast.com. The WOW Signal podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license.